Welcome to the Stranded Technologies Podcast. I'm your host and founder of Infinita Fund, Nicholas Anzinger. In this show, we talk about how to accelerate the future. Our thesis is that many life improving technologies are held back by institutional barriers. How can we unblock vast opportunities while mitigating against the risks? What ethical principles, rules, and regulations can guide us on that path? We will discuss these questions with entrepreneurs, policymakers, and industry experts. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars and visit us at infinitafund.com to join the community. Today is July the 24th and 2022, and my guest is Raymond March. Ray is the director of fdareview.org at the Independent Institute and assistant professor for economics at North Dakota State University. Ray, welcome to the show. A pleasure to be here. Ray, what would you like the audience to know about you? I'm a health economist. I've been studying pharmaceutical and medical regulation for the past seven or eight years. Most of my research is on the Food and Drug Administration. And the big takeaway for most of my research is the FDA overregulates. That's at the cost of patients, consumers, physicians, and a whole host of other people in the medical industry. And the best way forward to have better medical care and better health care in the United States is to get the FDA out of the way. How did you get into that area in the first place? I've always had an interest in regulation, specifically how much of it is needed, what kind of it is needed, and how could you possibly figure out the answers to those kinds of questions. And healthcare is a particularly interesting field in that it's very innovative, it's very adaptive, it moves quickly. There's a lot of challenges to de- addressing pandemics for one, but also a long-term diseases and other kinds of challenges to bring health care to people. So it's tempting, I think, to say complex industries require a lot of oversight. And the leap most people make with that is it needs oversight from a government, right, or from something like the Food and Drug Administration. And when I started reading up on the history of the FDA and what the FDA actually regulates and how outcomes in certain kinds of markets look before and after regulation, I said, I don't think that's right. And that sort of led me on an entire path. I did my dissertation on self-regulation in pharmaceutical markets. I've been researching what the FDA does in various aspects of the medical industry for several years. And that's just kind of been the story of my academic career for the last eight or nine years. In episode four, I talk with Jessica Flanagan about medical ethics. And today, Ray and I will talk about medical economics. Ray, what is public choice theory? Public choice theory broadly is defined as the economics of studying decisions made outside of a market. So in a typical market, you have consumers, you have producers, they meet together and form an exchange, and the exchange benefits both parties. Exchanges across all kinds of complex avenues are organized through price systems. As long as you don't mess with the price system, it's pretty good at communicating what are beneficial uses of resources and what are beneficial avenues people will use to pursue them and to buy them. Public choice says, take the market out of it. What do decisions look like when you don't have institutions like that? And probably the institution most people want to analyze through the lens of public choice is government. So I think, especially when we study healthcare economics, we're trying to analyze, if we use the public choice framework, what do decisions look like in terms of politicians and bureaucracies and regulators and special interest group, which the healthcare industry in the United States at least is rife with, what happens when those kinds of people are making decisions for the broader public? So public choice theory kind of uses economics to apply to political decisions in a way, right? So there's no, not what seems to be like a market for products and services, but there's still kind of people in politics that make political decisions are self-interested parties and look out for themselves. Yep, all you've done is change how they make decisions. And the interesting thing about that is you get to some fairly interesting conclusions, which may or may not actually be the way you would like them to make decisions. If you leave these kinds of complex decisions to people in the market, rather than outsource them to politicians. And it's kind of contrasted with the idealistic view that a market needs some kind of government framework to function. But public choice theory says, well, that framework isn't neutral. It isn't innocent. It isn't the idealistic case. There's people with their own interests in mind that are passing these regulations and laws, right? 
I want to discuss this with you, and especially when it comes to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, because I think it's important for my audience. Many of them are entrepreneurs, many of them in healthcare or in biotech. And when you're in that field, there's just no way around the FDA. The FDA is, as far as I know, the most powerful government authority or agency in the world. And entrepreneurs are often taught the incentives of venture capitalists, for example, right, and how to raise funding. But they rarely learn about the incentives of public institutions like the FDA, even though in health care and biotech, you depend as much, if not more, on your ability to navigate these institutions as on VCs and fundraising. So, for example, to get a drug to the market that often takes a decade and costs hundreds of millions, if not billions. Can you give us a background on the FDA? What does it do and why does it do it? Oh, so the FDA, going back into the 1960s or late 1950s, it's tasked with the job of determining what kinds of products are safe and efficient, or in other words, effective. So does it work and is it safe for a consumer to use? And that begins in the realm of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Now, as, as you mentioned, it's become a lot more powerful recently. The FDA has some regulatory hand in about 40% of all consumer products. So it's not just simply investors and entrepreneurs who are interested in healthcare. 40% means four out of 10 times if you're trying to make a product and bring it to the market, the FDA has some kind of a hand in saying how you can do that. So it's a very, very powerful organization and it uses its power. And unfortunately, it, it likes to expand its apparatus. It likes to take in more resources. It likes to add regulations to make sure in theory that the drug is a little bit more safe or prove, if you will, that it works a little bit better. And the reason that it does both is not because, counter to what most people think, so many drugs are dangerous and ineffective or so many products are dangerous and ineffective. The reason it does that, as we learned from public choice economics, is because the FDA is a bureaucracy. It, it's not a private enterprise. It doesn't have revenues and costs. It doesn't have to find a way to make sure it's providing goods and services effectively. Instead, its incentive as a government agency is take in more resources. That's how it succeeds. That's how it builds its clientele. That's how it survives. That's how people, bureaucrats who work in the FDA get more prestige. So instead of providing effective governance or effective quality control, saying this is a good product, this is not a good product, and we're going to give this to a consumer, say, and you're going to trust us because we do good work, it just builds up its apparatus and makes more and more regulation because that's how it survives. Wow. I was not aware that it's 40% of all consumer products. That's a massive number. How... That's probably a low estimate, too. That's an estimate I got from a paper in 2013. So considering we just went through the COVID pandemic and it's getting more involved in vaping products, as you might know, right? it's probably higher than that. So that's it's even scarier, unfortunately. Wow. It, that really blows my mind. I mean... Food is food, right? And drugs, you might think are drugs, but then it's also medical devices. And also I read in some of your work that software in healthcare is regulated as a medical device, right? If the FDA has its way, absolutely. That, that's, that's kind of a gray area, right? Because software going into healthcare, it's been around for a couple of decades, but that's still kind of a new idea. So the, the battle right now with the FDA is if you're using software to enhance a medical device, does that follow under the purview of the FDA? And of course, as a bureaucracy, right, it would love to be able to take on that regulatory apparatus and have its hand in that. And so far, unfortunately, I think it is heading that way. And just to illustrate, or draw a vivid picture. So if you're an entrepreneur in software, in like when it's a B2B software or a consumer software, you can code something at home. You can send it to your friends. You can put it on Product Hunt. You can post advertising for it. There is nobody really who goes after you. You might have to follow some data privacy regulations and things like that. But there's no barrier from you innovating and then giving it to someone else to use it. If you want to do the same thing with medical drugs or something you put together in your basement, any of what's within that 40% bracket, you have to go through the FDA in one form or another, which is a central bureaucracy in Washington. 
that is probably, if you're starting out, very hard to get access to. So that is a massive barrier and a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. How did it come about that it became so powerful? Because historically, it wasn't always like that, right? So in the early 60s, it gains the power to regulate safe and effective products through what what were then called early on pharmaceuticals. Then in the 70s, it extends the regulatory power to medical devices. And then it mostly just builds on gaining more influence until about the 1990s. In the 1990s, it starts to gain more influence into food. It gains regulatory power over tobacco. It starts to, if you will, cross between the USDA, which regulates a lot of food and farming products. And then really up until about the early 2000s, it becomes a massive bureaucracy. And that's when drugs start taking 12, 15 years and $1.4 billion on average to get through the regulatory process. Not to mention, right, if you have that much startup fund to get a drug onto the market and that many years to try to get a drug, which could be very innovative, to get to a prescription level right, where it can actually help a patient, that's going to deter tons of innovation. And that's what it did. In the early 2000s, it goes through a slight, a very slight, unfortunately, deregulatory process where it starts to cut back on the regulations required for generic medication, which is to say the drug's already been on the market. Competitors want to come make a cheaper version of it. They still have to get the cheaper, essentially same product approved by the FDA. And it took roughly 75% as long and 75% as costly to get that through. The FDA says, look, we, we did actually approve this product. It's chemically the same. Let's start to roll back. And when you have that, generics flood the market. And then beyond that, in the early 2000s, you start to have it pick up influence into biotechnology. It starts to gain a little bit more influence into like vaping products, which is a big bugaboo right now. And right now, this, this is, I think, a bit of interest to your audience. When COVID comes along, the FDA actually does, as far as I know, the only second big deregulatory effort in its history, where it starts to say, I'm going to use what's called an emergency use authorization which says it's going to take way too long to get these products on the market. There's a medical health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's deregulate. Let the market put, for example, COVID-19 tests on the market to serve people. After it's gone on the market, bring us evidence proving that it works. And it did that a little bit with vaccines, which we might talk about later. It did that with half a dozen COVID-19 related treatments. And overall, they work very effectively. So right now, the FDA is at kind of a standstill where its incentives are to keep making itself more influential, more powerful, right, a bigger regulatory agency. But the pandemic forced its hand to deregulate, at least on behalf of COVID. And people are starting to see, actually, that worked pretty well. Why does the FDA have this much power? So the next couple of years, I think, are going to be very influential in terms of does the FDA get bigger or start to cut back? Yeah, we're going to certainly talk more about that and about COVID. I started questioning or in in the first place, looking a bit more into the FDA and what it's doing and what impact it has. And we're going to talk a bit about more about that later. But I'm curious, what are the most typical arguments that you hear from people when it comes to why we need the FDA? Not necessarily the best arguments, but the arguments you hear most often. I'd say there's two. So the first argument going back into the history of the FDA is that medical goods, medical devices are really complicated products. Private industry tries to test them as best as possible. Once they go out into the general public, we don't know how effective they're going to be or potentially if there is going to be some kind of tail effect where it actually harms customers. We can't really know that from preeminent testing. So we need to have an agency come along and say, These need to be the standards to try to mitigate against these harms. The other one I think is a much less interesting or true argument, and that is that you have in a market, especially for medical goods, what's called asymmetric information, which is to say that in healthcare, doctors, pharmacists, medical scientists, pharmacologists, Drug developers are people who are responsible for bringing the goods to the market, know a lot more about the product than the consumer, the patient. 
And when that happens, the supplier, the people we just talked about, have kind of an advantageous position where they can push goods that might have negative effects or don't work as well as they're advertised. And the consumer is never going to figure this out, figure it out too late. And to make sure you have that imbalance somewhat corrected for you, have to have a third party come in and mitigate that potential. And that's what the FDA is usually thought of as doing. And is there any other arguments that you find more convincing they, than these two that is maybe not as often used? I don't know if I find any argument that convincing for why the FDA needs to do what it does or why we have an FDA. I think the concerns are justified. There's no question my doctor knows more about a particular kind of drug that, than me. There's no question people know more medical science than me. I'm an economist. Or I write about this stuff, but I don't know any real medicine. <laughs> But I don't think that's itself a good enough argument for needing the FDA or needing an organization that's going to bloat itself so big it costs a billion dollars for anyone to be able to enter the market. I think what that's an argument for is governance. And I'm not at all that convinced that governance can't come from market interactions. You can have private industries rate how effective products are. You can have private industries develop goods and then provide testimonies or provide assurances that these products work. Right? That's just a simple process of innovation and competition. And I just don't buy that giving the FDA that much authority doesn't skew how the market works in a better direction because the FDA has every incentive of a bureaucracy, which doesn't make market effective decisions. It makes decisions on its own interest. What I very often hear is there's these trade-offs between innovation and safety. So I think many people get that. you withholding things from the market, you wait longer so things are safe. And I think there's just an assumption that you get the best experts in the room, you get the medical scientists in the room, and they can make that trade-off. So what's wrong with that argument? There is a trade-off. The question is, what's the trade-off? And probably more importantly, what incentive does a private industry have to get the trade-off right versus a bureaucracy? So let me put it this way. If you are a private developer of a good, you have a very big incentive to make sure your product works. Otherwise, you have a very huge cost. Your trust is shattered. Your reputation will be tainted. Competitors will come in and wipe the floor with you because you got that trade off wrong. But that works because you face competition in a marketplace, right? To provide a more effective test or to provide a drug that has slightly less side effects, right? Or a more a safer drug. If you monopolize the ability to figure out what that trade-off is and give that to a federal agency, which is what the FDA is, then you have to wonder what's the incentive for that agency to ever take a risk? So what does it really benefit the FDA to say, this drug might be a little bit risky and all drugs are risky, or even medical devices are risky to some extent. What's their incentive to say, benefits outweigh the costs, put it on the market? Because then if the FDA is wrong, right, it gets backlash. It's never going to fold, but it gets backlash and its reputation is shot. But if the FDA says, no, it's risky, it's beneficial, but I want some more tests to really make sure I don't put a good onto the market that hurts people. And that's why you end up seeing three or four more years of testing, right? Or hundreds of mil literally hundreds of millions of dollars more in testing That doesn't give you any more reassurance the drug is that much more safer, that much more effective. So the delay in the approval process extends and extends and extends because the FDA doesn't get that benefit, right? If you hit the market first with a safe good and you're a producer or a medical device producer, for example, you get that benefit. You've made that profit. More importantly, from a societal standpoint, you have helped those patients. The FDA never receives that benefit. The FDA just bears the cost of being wrong. What we often see is high profile medical disasters. Like I think in the 1930s, it was called sulfalidomide. Yep. And in 19, I think, 57 or in the early 60s, it was talidomide, if I'm not mispronouncing yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. And that led to, I think, thousands of newborn babies that have found, that were found to have truncated limbs that used that drug in in west germany which led yes. to a huge scandal and i think that was also the main reason for 
for amendments that made the FDA way more powerful. So it seems to me that it's often these very high profile cases like that look very scary that compel governments to pass more regulations and make these agencies more powerful. I think that's right. But the thalidomide example is particularly interesting. because, As you pointed out, that happened in West Germany and a few other European countries. There was not a thalidomide crisis in the United States. In fact, if you go back in history, thalidomide in Europe was over the counter. So doctors didn't really have the ability to say you should not take thalidomide because it might produce a birth defect was the issue behind thalidomide. In the United States, there was really no assurance that it was going to be over the counter or not over the counter. It did come into the United States. Doctors wrote the manufacturer saying, this is a drug that could cause a birth defect. I haven't seen any tests, so I'm not going to prescribe this. So there wasn't a thalidomide crisis in the U.S. But that goes back to sort of the problem we've been talking about, right? Who was providing the governance in that instance? Yes, it's possible that manufacturers of medical goods mess up, right? The producer of thalidomide did mess up and provided a good that had this sort of tailwind effect. But thalidomide was governed in the United States by doctors saying, no, I know this is a teratogen, which is the medical term, meaning it can cause a birth effect or harm the embryo. And they said, we're not going to prescribe that. And they didn't in the United States. But even then, thalidomide, after that crisis, is still prescribed today. It's not prescribed to pregnant women, but it helps thousands of people survive stomach cancer, which can be extremely severe and hard to beat, even with current treatments. So it's even thalidomide, right, the scary one that gave the FDA a humongous amount of power, especially considering how much power it had before, that was still a question of governance. What is the theory of harm? So... The question is, when you have an agency like the FDA, is the FDA going to provide safety by taking potentially risky drugs and prohibiting them from reaching the market, which is what its job is supposed to be? It has to weigh that against the harm of taking a drug that could help somebody with whatever ailment that might happen to be, and then saying, we're not going to provide that. We're not going to let them access this. And we're not going to let that drug reach the market. So in both of those instances, right, bad drug gets on the market, good drug withheld from the market, you have harm because you either didn't treat a patient or you possibly treated a patient with a bad drug. The question is, which one is the FDA likely to bias itself toward? And the overwhelming evidence, if you compare what gets approved in Australia and Europe and the UK specifically, because the UK has somewhat of an FDA, not, not nearly as a powerful one, right, but a similar sort of organization, and you compare those rates, the FDA withholds drugs much longer, requires much more testing, which is to say that it's harming consumers. Exactly. So it's actively preventing people from getting treatments, getting drugs that would cause benefits to them. And an ex a good example of that is in the HIV crisis in the 1980s, when Europe had a drug, I think it was beta blockers, that were a good and effective treatment and while in the United States, people with HIV weren't able to get that drug. And it led to a huge protest movement against the FDA, correctly saying that they're killing people by not allowing it. It was seven years in that the FDA allowed it and then issued a press release saying, oh, now we're saving 10,000 people's lives per year because they're now able to access the drug, which is kind of implicitly admitting, well, 70,000 people didn't have access to the drug on time. Oh, absolutely. And that, that's just one example. Right? An earlier example than the whole beta blockers and experimental treatment with AIDS fiasco is going back in history, the development of insulin. So insulin, historically, when they had it in the early 1920s, was extracted from animals, right? So if you were a diabetic who needed insulin to live, a type 1 diabetic, you, at that time, you had insulin coming from pigs and coming from cows. When the 1940s comes along, you have human insulin. But the way human insulin was made back then was it was an artificial hormone created to resemble the hormones of a human. Problem is, in 1940s, the FDA has no idea what a synthetic hormone is. That was a breakthrough innovation. Medical science had not discovered how to do that, especially with a hormone like insulin. So the FDA says, we don't know how to regulate that. We need an entirely new regulatory apparatus to figure that out. So it withholds human insulin from the market going into the 1970s. So that was a 30-year process where people could have way, way more effective treatment with human insulin than from injecting animal hormones. 
And 30 years go by and diabetics weren't able to access that. The FDA eventually figures out, okay, this is how we're going to regulate synthetic hormones. Now we have a new regulatory process. Now diabetics can have insulin or human insulin. 30 years is just incredible. I didn't know about that case. Well, imagine all the diabetics. Well, you can't go more than about three or four weeks without insulin and you'll die. How many diabetics suffered? taking animal hormones, which have really serious consequences, obviously, when they could have had human insulin if the FDA just said, let's accept the European apparatus for this, or the Canadian apparatus, import the drug and let diabetics have access to this. Nope, let's delay it and figure out how to regulate this more. It just speaks more to the incentives of this agency. And to kind of summarize that argument, which is a classic public choice argument, so if you're a regulator or a policymaker, what is your risk when you're potentially allowing, even with a very small chance, a bad drug to the market? Then you have a very high profile disaster and you get ostracized and you fear for your career. And if you fail to release a good drug to the market, there's very few people seeing that. You can get away with it for 30 years without much of a public outcry. So you have an incentive to be hyper conservative in what you admit and you ask for more testing for longer time for more budget we need to be extra extra sure this is safe the customer which is companies that want to develop drugs and consumers who could potentially take the drugs they can't do anything about that you know they have to do what you say it's horrific and there are just i mean dozens of examples insulin's a historical let me give you a current one because the fda still has this incentive problem right even if it is moving in a direction i think it should it still very much has the incentive to overregulate. So there's a very good book out there by Darcy Owen. It's called The Right to Try. And in that book, she estimates 25,000 Americans die per year of cancer waiting for a drug treatment the FDA eventually approves. That's per year. So this is that the FDA does eventually approve the drug. So it didn't withhold a bad treatment getting to a cancer patient. It eventually approves it, right? It just took too long and the patient ends up dying. So where are the, who pays the cost for that? Obviously the patient with their life, right? But does the FDA pay a cost for that? No, of course not. And that's one of the biggest perverse incentives in the industry. And one more recent example, and you wrote a whole lot about this, and that influenced me a lot, was the COVID-19 pandemic. So can you talk about the role of the FDA and also other public health institutions such as the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization? Sure. All, all of these have the same incentive structure, right, which is to be overly conservative. The CDC has a, an array of issues, with few exceptions, usually doesn't regulate the good. It provides recommendations which guide public health institutions, right, or guide, if you will, governors to make certain recommendations about lockdowns and masks and these sort of public or these policy quandaries. The World Health Organization has another similar issue, right? If it sees the threat of COVID-19, right, or another monkeypox, right, to give, I guess, the latest one, it sees a potential emergency on the horizon. It doesn't really have any incentive to say, what are solutions, or in a way, the benefits of engaging in unprotected sex and monkeypox, right, or going out and trying to live your life even as COVID-19 spreads. It has no incentive to evaluate those benefits. It just sees the costs. So its incentive is to over-advise and say lockdown or make sure you take these kinds of treatments or don't engage in this kind of sexual act or don't come in contact or go to these kinds of parties if you think that monkey parts might be spread. The FDA, I think, of, of all those organizations that you mentioned, I think it's the most dangerous one because the FDA can literally say no, and that no can last decades. So when the FDA makes a decision with the same incentives as these other agencies, which is to be conservative, it can shut down product innovation. It can shut down entire avenues of research. And as you mentioned, COVID, the FDA did have a little bit of a deregulatory process with COVID. It did, if you will, issue emergency use authorizations for treatments. It did it for COVID tests. It's somewhat, I'm hesitant on this, it somewhat did that with Operation Warp Speed, which is the government policy trying to get the COVID-19 vaccine to people quicker. But that's an anomaly. And the fact that it had to issue emergency use authorizations for, I mean, goods that were absolutely unquestionably vital to bring the pandemic to an end just shows you, right, what was it doing in the first place? What, what 
regulatory acts were in place that prevented absolutely essential medical goods from reaching patients when none of these products were really removed from the market, right? It's not like the FDA provided more assurance and prevented bad goods from reaching the market. It got regulation out of the way and most of these products worked. Which is kind of like, why were the regulations there before? Also, what about the patients that don't have access to drugs where, where there isn't like a global pandemic that draws attention to it? You know, what about the cancer patients or HIV patients in the 80s, Alzheimer patients who are waiting for drugs to be released? Like there is no global pandemic that gives them an operation warp speed. You could make the argument that many people have Alzheimer's is going to be the next pandemic. I mean, you look at how many people have it or have early onset dementia or are going to suffer with that and die from that. It, it, it dwarfs like absolutely dwarfs COVID, <laughs> even as bad as COVID-19 got. It's no match for Alzheimer's, right? Or potential complications from diabetes, right? So why aren't there warp speeds for these kinds of drugs? Especially when we consider that COVID was a novel virus. Like COVID did not exist as far as we know before December of 2019. And innovators found tests and they found five really <laughs> different kinds of COVID vaccines that helped. Potentially, depending on how you want to count it, right, anywhere between six and 25 different COVID-19 treatments. And they found all of those in the first year of the pandemic, right, for a new virus. So how many drugs and treatments are being withheld for conditions we've known have existed for 20, 30 years, right? How much of, like Darcy Owens said, right, how much of that is hundreds of thousands of patients who are waiting and waiting for a drug that eventually gets approved? This is such an important point. You know, we see what we see. We have wondrous technology. We're very advanced when it comes to gene editing, when it comes to using engineering computers and software to basically create vaccines on a computer. What's been presented to us was mRNA vaccines as a novelty, something new. But in fact, there is a decades-long scientific history of mRNA vaccines, right? It was just that the way the system is structured that it's just slowed down massively and by decades. So the first Moderna vaccine was developed over the course of one weekend in January 2020, right? Yeah. Before the pandemic got into full swing. So what else is out there that we're not seeing? It's horrific to think about. I mean, there could be so many things out there that are just on the cusp, right? Or that venture capitalists are afraid to invest in because they know it's going to eat up way more money than it should and take 10 years to get a return on investment. How many investors would have loved to invest in the Moderna vaccine, right? And how much would Moderna have loved to have gotten the vaccine first to the market? But Moderna was second to Pfizer. Pfizer was way, way behind in the development process, even with Warp Speed, which helped it progress much faster. It was second. Moderna had it be literally before the first COVID-19 patient was diagnosed in the United States. I don't believe it's at all accurate to say the private market struggled to develop a vaccine. There's just no real evidence for that. There is evidence that it disentangled alliances or cooperation between investors and producers and scientists. I mean, and as you mentioned, right, coders in a lot of these cases to coordinate and be able to bring a life-saving pioneering medical treatment to market. There's no question the FDA prevented that. And just to pay that vivid picture even further, the information, the data that you need to make these innovations, they're very often freely accessible because, you know, we have the internet, we have things like GitHub, where we can share code, where we can share data. M millions of people worldwide can work on solutions, can work on testing, can work on novel vaccines or treatments, but they all have to go through one institution right? At least in the United States. But the FDA also has an outsized international influence. Can you talk a bit about uh -huh. that? There's two really things that come up with the international influence, one of which is the FDA is regulatory wise, the toughest. So if you want to get a drug approved, if you get it approved by the FDA, most countries are reasonable enough to say if it's approved in the United States, it's good enough for the UK, for India, for Canada, for Japan and places like that. But there's also the problem that America is a tremendous market, right? So a lot of Americans are on prescription drugs. A lot of Americans benefit tremendously from medical devices and medical technology. So if you can't get into the American market, what you have to do is go to international markets. And that tampers with a lot of the ability of people who are doing pioneering medical work, right, and discovering new ways to treat patients and new technologies that can help 
keep track of certain kinds of health illnesses. And if they can't get through the American regulatory process, they have to find other ways to compete, which incidentally is why a lot of medical innovation goes into countries which don't have as advanced of a healthcare industry. But broadly speaking, I think the issue for international compliance is that when other countries see the FDA approval and are fully willing to import drugs because it has the FDA stamp, the FDA will not do that. So the FDA will look at drugs approved in the UK, which is usually the best comparison for these kind of things, and say that'll work, but we need, first of all, international inspectors, which incidentally were all sent home before the COVID-19 pandemic happened, so we couldn't import a lot of international drugs, which shuts down global markets, speaking of supply chain issues. But even beyond that, right, no, it, it's gone through the UK process. Now it has to go through a modified UK to America FDA process. Where other countries don't do that, the FDA delays innovation that happens across the globe, and it doesn't allow it to enter our borders. And in a lot of ways, it obfuscates markets for international drugs. I do a lot of work in Latin America, and I was curious how it is there. Well, could you, if you're in Chile or in Colombia, develop a new drug or medical device and just tell it to people? Well, you can't. There's typically national health ministries that copy-paste the regulations from the FDA, but at the same time have no capacity to run or observe or audit clinical trials. So <laughs> they're kind of saying, no, you're not allowed to do that. But we also can help you with the approval process. So you're almost forced to go out of the country and venture capitalists fund you to go to the United States to go through the approval process there. So it also takes the innovation out of other countries. Yeah, in a lot of ways it does. And one more point to add to that, because that's a very important point, is that when you have issues like that... More often than not, what you've done is cut off the market. So if I can only bring my drug to market in Venezuela or Chile, I know has a pretty big pharmaceutical development sector, and you can only do it in Chile, a lot of venture capitalists will say, well, what's the market in Chile? Well, it's much smaller than the United States and certainly a lot smaller than countries which abide by the international standards of the FDA, right? You've curtailed that market, which tells them, well, that upside is a lot smaller, right? I'm probably better off investing in a longer term strategy than the for a drug that would get through the FDA process or has a chance to. But that also curtails innovation, right? Because then you go through the standard process of investing in drugs that will eventually probably make it through that. But better innovative practices are happening in other countries and they get tossed by the wayside simply because the FDA curtails the market. There was one a, a more recent example with Omicron booster shots. Can you talk about that? This is actually very timely, incidentally, because we have two new Omicron variants. They're going to keep happening, right? It's, it's an endemic virus. It's fundamentally a coronavirus. What those do is adapt very quickly. That, that, we knew about that way before COVID-19 existed. But there's two new ones of those. They're spreading quickly. And the problem with those, at least from a public health standpoint, is they're evading past immunity. Again, not that surprising. They're also evading past vaccines. So if you ended up getting a booster from Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, or Moderna, you're probably not going to have as much, as much immunity buildup if you get infected with BA5, which is the most recent variant. So the question is, if COVID-19 can't be eradicated, and we, we've ne almost never eradicated a virus, right? Smallpox being the outlier. How do you develop effective treatments for this? Because BA5 is not as deadly as like Delta or the original strain, right? But it could still be harmful for older patients or patients with pre-existing conditions. The answer intuitively seems right. You have to be able to amend and adapt treatments. Or you have to find a treatment method that works better with Omicron or BA5 than it did with the original strand. But the nasty part is, or the, the confusing part about all this is, we don't see that. Right. What we see is people recommending get your visor shot earlier. Right. So now you can get a visor shot. It's been authorized by the FDA. Right. If you're older than six months old. And that's strange because kids don't really get hurt from COVID-19. Right. My kids had COVID-19. They were sick for about three hours. I, I exaggerate not. But kids in general don't really get sick from it. And there's very little evidence that kids can transmit. COVID-19 to older populations or to particularly at-risk populations. So what is the point in that other than that we already have the vaccine authorized? 
the other confusing part about a lot of this policy is we know the vaccines are going to be less effective the more the virus mutates, but we're still recommending senior citizens to get three boosters, right, or four boosters. I read an article the other day saying, should senior citizens get a fifth booster? The FDA hasn't authorized that yet. But the fact that we're so invested, to use that word lightly, in giving more and more and more and more people an old vaccine we know is not adapted to current mutations of COVID says that we're really putting our faith in older treatments when we know we need more innovation. So why is the innovation being withheld? And that's a project I've been working on for the last couple of years. And how does that project look like? So what I am finding is, and this goes back to public choices we had talked about earlier, the reason we got the initial three vaccines, right? So Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Moderna, not AstraZeneca, which is for a while was the most globally used one, and not Novavax, which was actually approved a couple of days ago. We get that through Operation Warp Speed. That Part of that is it gets funding from a blank check, as President Trump, former President Trump formally put it, to invest in these products, to use laboratories that the federal government built. But what really got the vaccines to patients quickly wasn't federal funding. It was the process of deregulating how long it takes a vaccine to get to market. We talked about drugs taking 10 years and over a billion dollars to get onto the market. Vaccines take longer. Like vaccines are, that would be a very short turnaround for a vaccine. But what Warp Speed does is says, we're going to let you overlap the regulatory process, right? So you don't have to go through all four phases. If it seems like it's doing well in the first phase, you can start to use data and you can start to use trials and you can start to enter the second phase, assuming the numbers are good enough. And what that does is allow a process which probably would have taken without warp speed, oh gosh, 10 years, probably, maybe 12, to get it done in about eight months. Now, mind you, private companies already had been doing that because they don't spend 12 years and then submit data to the FDA and take another 12 years, right? They understand when a project is probably going to succeed and they speed it up because you have to rush to get the drug onto the market. That's how you compete in a lot of these cases. But the nasty part about warp speed is government decided we're going to offer the accelerated process and the laboratories and the funds to this particular group of vaccines. And that happened to be mRNA influence. And it happened to be those drug developers. So now that those drug developers had done their pioneering medical work and helped treat the Delta variant and the original variant, and the virus continues to mutate, there's no question those original vaccines aren't going to protect patients as well as for later variants. Why in the world is it taking, why did it take Norovax, for example, so much longer to get FDA authorization? Why did AstraZeneca never get FDA authorization when it was used for a while. It was the most popular COVID-19 vaccine in the world, right? And that's not, and the FDA withheld it saying you're not going to be part of Operation Warp Speed because you're not going to use mRNA. It's the way we would like it. The answer to that fundamentally comes down to, in public choice, what is called special interests or rent seeking. So you had these powerful corporations which had political influence to get into Operation Warp Speed. AstraZeneca just simply did not have the political influence as Pfizer. And they don't get the special treatment. So without the special treatment and access to Warp Speed, they have to go through the sluggish and elongated process, which means they don't get on the U.S. market. They did well on international markets, but they didn't get on the U.S. market. And as you mentioned, that can be somewhat of a problem, even in COVID times. But now we hear a lot about experimental treatments and experimental vaccines, which are going to be way better to treat Omicron and BA4 and BA5, which are the current variants. But the FDA doesn't open up Operation Warp Speed to them because it gave that special favor to the original batch of vaccines. So even though we have the potential to help eradicate BA4 and BA5 and provide better vaccination for them, because they didn't get the special treatment of Operation Warp Speed, they're kind of sunk. Unfortunately, that also means that the patients who want to avoid getting BA5 are also sunk. And that's a very important dimension of the consequences of the public choice argument that you're making. It benefits big business. So yes. these regulations are typically, as a result, protecting them from competition. If you have to go through an expensive and lengthy approval process, 
that's not affordable for smaller companies and you're not high profile enough or have good enough connections to be part of Operation Warp Speed. So as a small company, the only way for you, if you have like a great invention, a great idea for a new vaccine or a new treatment is really to get in with the big companies, right? Yeah. In a lot of cases, they'll sell off the rights to that drug or that treatment, if you will, to a bigger company. That's why Johnson & Johnson Pfizer gets so many new drugs. It's not because they're super innovative. I mean, by a lot of comparisons, they're not very innovative. They're very good at lobbying, right? And they're very large and have a lot of capital, but they're not great at innovating. Oftentimes, big companies just aren't very innovative, right? Because they specialize in doing one thing, whereas smaller, more nimble companies can do a whole host of other things and be more innovative on the margin. That's the trade-off of special interest is you might have a great product. You'll never have enough capital to get through 10 years and a billion dollars to get your drug onto the market or to go through the FDA process. So you sell the rights off to a big company, which again, right, means you made somewhat money, but you weren't really competing on a level playing field. But that's how special interests work. The sad and depressing result for venture capital and startups is that it's very hard, if not impossible, for a small startup to become a big pharma company. Listeners, call me out on that, please, if I have the data wrong. But as far as I know, there have been two com companies with pharmaceutical products that became $1 billion and higher dollar companies, which are, coincidentally, BioNTech and Moderna. <laughs> the reason was that the COVID-19 crisis accelerated their demand or need for their product. They were able to get into working with the right companies, working with governments, with Operation Warp Speed to become the, you know, I mean, I'm glad that they did what they did, but it's just two. And it could be dozens, maybe hundreds of other companies that would have a shot at developing better treatments and therapies. And if, if there were, if it wasn't for the way these incentives are structured and the consequence of that is there is less venture capital because it's just so insanely hard to build a big company. Absolutely. I mean, companies do get built through innovative processes. You do see that. But the question, especially in the healthcare industry, right? So focusing, if you will, a little bit more on that, what we end up with is trying to question, how do you make a very successful product and make it, as you mentioned, right, become a billion dollar enterprise? You can either do it through innovation, right? Because that's the fundamental game that healthcare providers are trying to do is innovate and provide better medical care. You can do that, which means you have to out-innovate all of your competition, which makes it tough to become big in the first place because you have to be that much more nimble and that much more creative, right? And hire that much more talent away from your competitors. It's a tough game. Or you can find a way to stop competition, not from being a better competitor, but from stopping them from competing with you by getting special treatment from the government. And when you see, in a lot of cases, the bigger pharmaceutical companies are spending 20% of their budget lobbying instead of on R&D, you have to wonder how much more effective is it in these situations to lobby the government for favors than it is to compete. And another interesting note on that is to be able to go to the market as a pharmaceutical or drug company, you have to pass all these regulations. It's extremely expensive. It takes often up to 10 years. What I say is you have to do a sprint in a marathon to get to the starting line. <laughs> you know, then you're at the starting line all exhausted. <laughs> An entrepreneur that spent 10 years going through clinical trials, <laughs> which are very complex to navigate and very stressful, I'm pretty sure. Then you have a product, but you haven't spent any time on developing any distribution, supply chain, production, logistics, none of these. And coincidentally, these are things where you have economies of scale. So being big matters. So competing with a Johnson Johnson or a Pfizer on supply chain is a gargantuan task. It's like founding a new extremely high risk startup. So oh, as absolutely. an entrepreneur, you face the choice. You can sell your company for a couple of hundreds of millions in a clinical trial stage like three to one of these big companies, or you basically have to start all over with an extremely risky startup. And to add to that just a little bit, right, the FDA very heavily regulates distribution and manufacturing. So even if you get through, even if you somehow got the venture capital to get the billion dollars to compete with Pfizer, for example, you come to the end of it, right, the FDA still monitors you the entire time through your manufacturing. So it's not like you can just sign, you know, get your drug approved, 
and then maybe outsource that to a manufacturing company because they have extremely high costs too because they're very highly regulated. So many people, many listeners that hear that would say, yes, these are all problems. This sucks. Okay. But what's the alternative? The alternative to public governance is private governance. The problems of asymmetric information and trying to innovate and solve medical problems, broadly construed, and problems of healthcare is delivering goods to patients. They don't go away because the FDA goes away. The FDA, I think, in many, many cases makes them worse, but you still have to be able to find infrastructure that's going to be able to say this is a safe product, this is a trustworthy product. This is how this drug should be manufactured. This is where it should be manufactured if you broaden the market up to international levels. The incentives are a lot more aligned for private interest to provide patients with goods than people previously thought. Just to ask you a quick question, right? Can you think of a product that you buy regularly where you know as much or more about it than the person who made it? No. Okay. Well, what does that tell you about markets? Markets in a lot of cases work <laughs> because there is asymmetric information, right? That always exists. But yet somehow we still coordinate and generally trust the products we get. And I know medicine is complicated. I know it's scary. I know in a lot of cases it's very high stakes because people have illnesses or conditions they'd like to be rid of. But I don't think it's special in that regard. And I think more importantly, trusting public governance to solve some of these problems is just a fool's errand. And we discussed also in other podcasts. So what can you do as an entrepreneur if you want to start trying fixing these problems? And we were coming up with some solutions like alternative jurisdictions. So Australia, for example, makes it cheaper to do clinical trials. Does anyone have a ethical problem with that <laughs> or medical tourism? You just go to another country that allows the drugs that you have. And there's increasingly a market that's extremely rapidly growing that is offering people bundled packages. You order it on a website. They put you in a flight. They put you in a five-star hotel to, say, Mexico or Thailand or Turkey, which have excellent medical facilities mm -hmm. to get treatments. As far as I'm aware, these aren't in drugs that are considered controversial or high risk. It's more for plastic surgeries and things like that. But it's a fast-growing market. And also, to anyone I tell this argument to, they don't seem to have a moral problem with it. <laughs> No, I would hope there wouldn't be a moral problem with that. But let me give you one more example of on that front. So we were talking about COVID. We've talked a little bit about monkeypox. The big bugaboo before COVID-19 came along, even before H1A1 came along, was Ebola. We had a case in the United States. It, the patient died, right? He was traveling from Africa. There were Ebola outbreaks in Western Africa, to the best of my knowledge, which killed several thousand people. Ebola's vaccine was developed in literally one year and three months. Do you know who developed that vaccine? Tell me. Literally not one country. Because clinical trials were conducted in Australia, in Asia, in Africa, even in impoverished parts of Africa. Vaccine development was done in Canada. Some of it was done in the United States. A tremendous amount of the clinical trial data was processed and utilized in Mexico. And Ebola, in a lot of ways, is it's certainly much more fatal than COVID, right? But Ebola was much, much harder medically to develop a vaccine for than COVID. But what the example of the Ebola vaccine tells us is there are lots of resources all across the world. And the fact that they were able to coordinate across these countries, many of the countries had never had a single case of Ebola. I didn't know what Ebola was, but could still contribute in the division of labor to help produce the vaccine And that short of a time tells you the power of markets. More importantly, and as we've been talking, right, it tells you the power of getting rid of regulation and allowing people to cooperate on this front. It also shows the power of open innovation, right? Yes. So we have a more globalized world. We have more ability to share capital people, although way too little, and ideas across borders. And, you know, if I'm creating something new in Turkey, I can easily put it online. I can put it on the GitHub. I can, you know, I typically have peers in lots of other countries if I'm a scientist or if I work on data analytics and other people help me figure out solutions. And I think that's something that I strongly believe in can be a solution to some of these problems, sort of innovate across borders, share talent, ideas, capital. Yeah, and it's something that the FDA was never involved in. Right. So that's a judgment, right? That these processes can happen organically because there is a global problem 
interested and talented people working on it, right? The FDA was not involved in any of that process. It's amazing to me. Like we, that process among other things has led to fantastic technology being available. It's just withheld from the market being ready to release and to be unlocked, which is the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and probably also, probably also for you, right? We want to open up these innovations to the public and to the market. Yeah, absolutely. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Ray. This was eye-opening. I learned so much, so many new numbers that I just had no idea how massive the problem is. And I think it's really useful to have the perspective of an economist just to put numbers on the problem. And you gave so many vivid examples. As we said, we want to build a more open, a more inclusive system for medical innovation, where in the future, when there's a pandemic, we can quickly react to it. We can quickly share information, quickly develop vaccines and quickly roll it out and give to people and get data on it. So if you want to help us shape that vision, please join us at the Prospera Health Tech Summit in September 23 to 25, together with other medical innovators, entrepreneurs and investors on the beautiful Caribbean island of Rodan, off of the country of Honduras. Go to infinitafund.com to sign up for the conference. Ray, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, I had fun. Thank you. <laughs>